Okay, and this is a presentation on my uh, master's thesis, the Thormo reactor, a nuclear power plant with no moving parts. In order to re reach that goal, we wanted to get rid of control rods by making it accelerator driven with a subcritical pile. Thorium is not technically necessary, but it, as long as I've got all those fast neutrons, might as well breed. Mercury provides the spellation target. It's a liquid metal, and liquid metal spellation targets are the most common uh, suggestion. And then to make the generation happen with no moving parts. We do magnetohydrodynamic generation. And of course, to continue circulating the fluids, we use natural pressurization changes and gravity head to avoid pumps. Now when you're doing accelerator driven, you start with a high flux proton beam uh, or some other electron beams have been used but they really don't have enough uh, energy and flux to make a big difference. You then take a heavy metal target because then you can remove the heat very easily. The design basis after doing some simulations well I, I found 300 MeV was a good compromise between beam efficiency and number of proton neutrons released from the spallation per proton. You have some great safety features in accelerator driven systems. It, when the beam turns off, the system is automatically uh, subcritical and, and is, it's the same as cramming a, a, a normal reactor. If the target disappears for some reason, uh, then again, the, the, no more neutron spallation happening and you get uh, a scram situation. And in both of these cases, because there is extra fission happening from these really, really fast neutrons, you also end up with the K-effect of dropping and uh, an addition to the scram. Uh, now when you have a subcritical pile, your multiplication factor is an infinite sum of numbers less than one. And the, the, that infinite sum ends up having a one over one minus the K effective as its if effective uh, multiplier. So we have a final if I take 3.4 neutrons per incident proton, that proton is 300 MeV. Then I have 200 MeV fission from the fission of a neutron. And I divide, I multiply by my infinite multiplication, my infinite addition. Then I find that a 0.95 K effective gives me a 40 K times thermal out versus beam in. Now the thorium fuel cycle, I don't need to tell people here about that, but it's many times more abundant than uranium. You, you can do long load fuel times because the breeding is better in, and it breeds in fast epithermal and thermal reactors. And it's available in almost every country in the world. So you can take this design to any country in the world they get a, an initial seed fissile from the IAEA and then they can continue with no additional need for international agreements for fueling this, these reactors. Mercury is very cool as a cool is, is very nice as a coolant because it has low viscosity. Uh, 356 degrees Celsius boiling point at one atmosphere, which is a temperature range well understood in nuclear engineering. It has a high um, cross-section of absorption, so it's not really suitable for channel type 
thermal reactors because it would absorb a lot of the neutrons and you need, want those neutrons to do other things. Now, in very small reactors, such as the Clementine reactor, which was one of the first nuclear reactors, the mercury is both an integral neutron and gamma shielding. So, um, <clears throat> you can make it a very, very compact reactor. You can, uh, a uh, critical mass of, of plutonium is literally, you know, fist size. And you, cooling that with mercury, you, your entire reactor could be fully shielded in uh, a, a package a foot a, a, across. Now, mercury dissolves many metals, and this is a good thing if the fission products, if fission products from fuel, from a fuel failure, get released. The mercury will keep them in solution, and because we're doing a boiling mercury system, that boiling keeps the steam pure. So that there will never be fission products in the steam. A magnetic hydrodynamic generation system passes a moving charged fluid through a magnetic field and that generates a force. Similarly, if you have a force acting on a moving fluid, that current, it generates a current. So it requires a change, a ch charge in a kinetic stream. We provide the charge with a non-contact helicon coil, which can generate uh, up to, you know, tens of EV, but in this case we wouldn't need that hot much. Um, mercury has a fairly low ionization level, which is why it's used in mercury vapor lamps, and it, uh, so we could make a mercury, a charged mercury steam very easily. Monatomic gases are best, which mercury is, and the kinetic energy di converts directly into electric current from the moving fluid. Now, this was my three meter core layout I used for this uh, final breed even design. We have a plutonium thorium mix in heavy metal in the red area and then uh, thorium in uh, in a magnesium fluoride salt in the blue area and then solid thorium metal in the corners the where we have thermalized neutrons anyway and we might as well breed as much as possible there's not going to be a significant amount of fission happening there The heat is going to be removed at the surface by the boiling mercury. We have no internal structure. Now, since the majority of fission is going to occur in the center, that's where the most of the heat is going to be transmitted. And it's going to come up the, the uh, spallation shaft through normal convective currents and if that convective current is not fast enough to fully re remove and we get localized boiling then it will reduce the um, amount of spallation and the position of the spallation is going to move further down to where there's still fully uh, full density liquid mercury and it will uh, actually go drop in K effective which will drop the power output automatically controlling for the power output that we can actually accomplish with the heat transfer. The neutron spectrum from spallation in the center of this core is really really fast. The bold blue line at the top is our 
uh, spallation source. Um, you'll notice there's a dip at the about 15 MeV level. That's uh, a uh, an absorption uh, band for one of the materials. But then we have uh, the fission neutrons below that. Above that is only spallation neutrons. Fission neutrons don't usually come out at faster than about 15 MeV. And uh, we get a fairly good distribution of nice fast neutrons after that. Then in the fuel areas, in cells 17 through 417, this is going out radially from the spallation zone, we get um, almost the same uh, neutron spectrum. We, we have some spallation neutrons still reaching out that far, lower, less and less as we go further out until uh, you see by cell 317 we have actually uh, got all the most of the spallation neutrons uh, absorbed and we aren't seeing very much above 15 MeV. In fact, in 417 there is none. And uh, so you wouldn't want to make this, the, this core less than about 75 centimeters in diameter, even if you didn't need the K effective. If you would increase the, the uh, fissile loading to have it a burner core, you wouldn't want to make it less than 75 centimeters. And then we see the breed even happening. Not only does this maintain for 10 years the K effective, despite all this burn down in the plutonium that you see in this bright red line and the brown line underneath it, which is the plutonium-241. Uh, and you see that we uh, completely match that with our U-233 breeding. And because U-233 is a better fissile material, the K-effective almost uh, in fact, goes up slightly over the lifetime. The fissile inventory drops from 1071 kilograms to 1069 over the 146 gigawatt days that we run ran this core in the simulation. So, in summary. We start with a 300 MeV, 1 megawatt proton beam, which costs about 3 M megawatts electric to run. Mercury spallation produces 3.4 neutrons from each pro proton. The subcritical assembly then brings that to 40 megawatts thermal in the mercury steam. The magnetohydrate dynamic generator generates about 15 megawatts electric out of that and a condenser turns the steam back into uh, liquid maintaining a, keeping a pressure differential through the system so all the fluids move through and the condensate flows from that condenser back into the core. So. I know it's a quick uh, run through, but are there any questions?